Okay, we'll kick off. Thank you everyone for joining the next webinar in our Independent School Board Mastery Series, where we're intending to provide you with expert insights and strategies for governance success in your schools. This is the fourth in our series, so many of you may have joined us in previous sessions, but each month we deep dive into some of the underlying governance issues that have been identified within the top risks found by Aon's 2022 Independent Schools Risk Report. We have housed all of the past webinars in one spot with the link provided there, and this will be shared with you when the recording is sent as well. But if you have missed any of the previous sessions, you can just click on that link and jump in nice and easy. To give you a recap on the top five risks that the Independent Schools Risk Report found, it was all about attracting and retaining talent, which is what our previous webinars have been touching on. Today and next month's webinars will be touching on cyber threat. And then we move on to the important topics of mental health, pandemic risk, planning for big events, and student safety. So we only have you for 30 minutes, so a lot of meaty content to get through in that time. So we shall kick off. Today I'm joined by the wonderful Fee Mercer, who you'll have seen her lovely face on our previous sessions. Fee is the CEO and founder of Govern With, is a government expert and sits on many not-for-profit boards. So wonderful to have you join us again, Faye. Today, we're also joined by Michael Parent, who is, I am lucky to have as one of my Aon colleagues. Michael actually leads our cyber practice group, is an absolute cyber guru. He gets involved in some of the most difficult negotiations that we have, crafts our policy wordings with insurers, get stuck in when we have unfortunate claim situations and really is our go-to cyber expert. So we're really lucky and privileged to have you join us this morning, Michael. So today we're going to talk about cybersecurity and how schools like you can stay ahead of the curve. We'll touch principally on the risk itself and how it has developed in recent years and really have a spotlight on human behavior. Today, we're not going to get in specifically to the techie side of things that you can do to protect yourself. That will be the concept of next month's webinar. So today is all big picture, what you can do to protect yourself, as well as enhancing your awareness on the risk itself. So the three topics that we'll talk through is the cyber trends that we're seeing in 2023, education sector specific challenges, as well as the management strategies that you all should be considering to protect yourself as much as possible with respect to cybersecurity. So with that, Michael, can you talk us through the trends that we're currently seeing? Yeah, sure. Trying to keep that within 30 minutes may be a challenge. So I thought the probably the best way to do it would be to just bring up this particular slide and just talk to this slide because I think it's really reflective of what hopefully everyone has been seeing and feeling over the last few years. So what we've done is we've indexed the number of cyber events that have happened over the last few years, 2019 on this slide, and indexed those and split those between ransomware attacks and pure data breaches. I should stress that we started this project back in 2018 but for ease of review, we've actually only kept it to 2019 and onwards for this because the mountain that you can see there in front of you from a ransomware attack perspective is just even bigger and harder to comprehend. But what this particular slide is telling us is that since, say, 2019, let's call it roughly the start of the COVID period, we've seen a significant uptick in the number of ransomware attacks as compared to the number of pure data breaches. Pure data breaches themselves have dropped off quite sharply. Conversely, we're seeing the ransomware attacks have increased quite sharply. Really quickly, just at the end of the slide here, you can see the ransomware attacks are trending down. That, we believe, a bit of a moment in time where ransomware attacks were indeed just being controlled quite heavily by certain state actors. We believe, in fact, the updated position on this is that the ransomware attacks are trending back upwards, which is, again, a, an alarming trend that we are seeing, something that we had anticipated, unfortunately. 
But why is this really important? This particular graph where you can see the rent and wear attacks increasing sharply, the mountain, let's call it for today, that happened to roughly coincide with roughly the same increase in, say, premiums and complexity from purchasing cyber insurance. And that's because these particular losses were by and large unanticipated by the market. We say that we had seen ransomware attacks historically, but only in the last few years have they been truly weaponized to cause companies significant damage. A ransomware attack will almost always be more expensive than a pure data breach. There are some rare examples, but you can anticipate that when you're suffering a ransomware attack, you can anticipate it's going to be harder to deal with than a pure data breach. It all was a surprise for insurers. It's all been a surprise for everyone, frankly, even in the security space, just how bad these have been and how pervasive they've been. And unfortunately, whilst we did have that period of a lull, we are now anticipating it being a worse outcome going forward because, frankly, the attacks that are now going through the ecosystem have had about 12, 12 odd months of learning from current global events on how to improve their cyber attacks and using some of that collateral coming through. So the anticipation here is that whilst the cyber market is softening and to a degree has understood and now underwriting for ransomware attacks, the expectation should be that they continue to trend up in the short term. But we just wanted to really also articulate that it's, it, it is the education industry that is suffering these particular instances as well, both cyber attacks from a ransomware perspective as well as data breaches. The OAIC report here, which is primarily a data breach, if you think in that fashion, education is the third most impacted um, industry next to health and finance. Health and finance will swap number one and number two every now and again, but those will probably always be high on the radar, given the wealth of data that they collect. And then we can see on the flip side, we've got the, the reports to the ACSC, Australian Cyber Security Centre. Again, education is featuring quite sharply on that radar as well. So that's your attacks there. So it's not just us saying this, myself saying this and Lynette saying this. We've also got two Australian institutions saying that education are continually on the, on the radar when it comes to cyber attacks. Again, not dissimilar to health and finance. Education typically have a wealth of information. They typically have a lot of entry points. By nature, their security networks are porous and easy to, to traverse. And really importantly, you'll hear on this a couple of times throughout the day, the potential lack of security. And let's just dumb that down today for or focusing on multi-factor authentication. I won't spoil the surprise because there's a bit more coming through soon, um, but these are the three main categories that are increasingly causing complexity and concern for all industries, certainly of which education are a major part of. Uh, Michael, we have actually seen quite a few losses ourselves in the education sector as well, both amongst Aon clients and then obviously our insurer partner, CFC, witnesses these around the globe as well. And I think it's really powerful way to, to talk through some of the real life claims examples. And we'll share a couple of case studies now. The first one is a scenario whereby a bursar received what looked like a Microsoft email. It looked very authentic, asking them to simply log in. So the bursar put in his username and password Everything still looked safe, but what he had actually done was give cyber criminals access to his credentials. The fact is then that school, as Michael mentioned, didn't have multi-factor authentication across its stakeholders. So neither its students nor its staff had this, which meant that all the cyber criminal needed to do to enter into the entirety of the computer system was the username and password, which he had to hand. So immediately the cyber criminal gained access into the school's computer systems and was able to gather some um, data that, that, that they could yet then take advantage of. So the cyber criminal found the parents database did a lot of research so didn't do a scattergun approach actually researched which of these parents were overseas and then did a targeted email which for all intents and purposes looked like it came from the bursar it looked very credible again and sent an email to these parents suggesting that if they paid the next next year's fees 
in advance, they could get a 25% discount, but it had a time elapse on it. Six parents actually fell for the scam and provided their details. It soon came to the realization of the school when one of those parents chased the schools asking for an update and a receipt, and they discovered that this had transpired. All of the six parents tried to get reimbursement from the bank. Two of them were successful in doing that, but it meant that four sets of parents were not able to get any reimbursement, and it was $60,000 that was impacted. This is a case study which really just shows I think the skillfulness of cyber criminals the extent that they'll go to in terms of their strategy they are very sophisticated and it also shows some of the risk management strategies that we in schools need to be aware of we have a, a large stakeholder group and really it's the lack of awareness across staff, across students, across parents, volunteers, that can all open us up to specific cyber events. Multi-path identification plays throughout really all of the this case studies today, but where we don't have that, it is so easy to actually infiltrate your systems. It's also a good example that shows that banks won't always reimburse. And I think some people still think that is as a situation that the banks would reimburse. And this situation also just showed the safety of having an insurance net. So in this circumstance, the school was actually able to rely on their CFC cyber policy to reimburse those parents that had paid the money. So I think that's a very good example. Michael, you've got a few others too. Yeah, I'll cover off on this one. This one's probably a little bit more technical, but just before we do, two things, just adding on to what Lynette said as well, the, some statistics came out, I think, only yesterday of just how much cyber crime scamming really means to the Australian economy. And it's a very big number. We do get some pretty broad coverage from CFC in regards to their cyber policy. So that gives us probably broader than your average coverage compared to many other cyber policies. It's probably really important to say that not all cyber policies are made the same. So the benefits of the CFC policy really can't be understated. Moving on to this slide, this is a bit more technical. So one of the myths that this particular scenario helps to dispel is that I'm too small to, to be a target. Why, why would a criminal even know I exist, let alone come after me? The reality is these attacks are automated in 99% of the time. And a brute force attack, what that is, is someone who finds an IP address, they don't even know who the entity is at the back end of that, they just find some vulnerabilities, they find that there's a password that, that needs to be utilised to access the system, and they conduct this thing called a brute force attack, which is just dumping hundreds and hundreds of thousands of passwords at that point, all fully automated, all done within seconds. Unless you've got extremely good passwords in place, it's very likely that the brute force attack will work. We can get much more technical on that if we would like. But needless to say, a brute force attack is very basic entry points or attacks. But what it does is when targeted at something like an RDP, which is a remote desktop protocol, which is basically what we all migrated to when we all went into COVID, we all started using a lot of remote accessing to, to company networks. That remote desktop protocol allows that. So what you've got here is a weak password on an internet enabled access point. And the school in this particular instance Again, as we can see here, had a simple password. And worse than that, it was the administrator within the school who had a simple password. And as we promised, we'd mentioned this a few times, unfortunately, the school didn't have multi-factor authentication. We will be saying this a few more times as well. That allows the, act, the, the bad actor to gain access and start traversing the network as they see and as they want to do whatever they particular want to do. In this instance, they deployed malware known as ransomware. And in this particular instance, we don't believe that data was exfiltrated. And that's a big win because you can then start having some interesting conversations with them. So in this particular instance, again, CFC relatively uniquely have some decryption keys available to them. And what that means is that in, when you encrypt something, which is what the criminal is doing, if you've got the decryption key, you can unravel that. So your scrambled data now looks human 
again, and you can re read it. What that means is that you can negate the need to even consider paying the ransom. And that's a very big win because there's a lot of attention on paying ransoms in the media right now. But what that also does is then it means you can move on from the negotiations, you can start fixing systems, which is exactly what this organization did. And again, a lot of the costs associated with that were covered by the CFC policy. Um, really just want to stipulate virtual private networks, VPNs, they help to mitigate these sorts of issues. Passwords always have complex passwords, never recycle passwords, never reuse passwords. Multi-factor authentication is essential. And daily backups are even more important these days as well. Obviously, adapting and keeping your backups with appropriate protections in place as well, such as encryption and multi-factor authentication. Um, we might move on to the next one, Lynette, if you want, and happy to yeah. have this one to you. And we'll just touch on this very briefly because a lot of you on the call are probably very familiar. Newcastle Grammar have been quite open in sharing their learnings from their cyber attack that they suffered in November 2020. Uh, which really cripples them. But it, it actually, for them, just showed how interconnected and how important their computer systems were to everything. It even controls the gate access to the school, the printers, access cards, everything. So we'll not necessarily go into this because we have hosted webinars on it in the past and we'll provide you to the link to those recordings. But this was a, a big ticket one. It was a million dollar ransom and the school was on its knees. It lost access to everything. And Erica, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is very open in, in talking about the loss because they felt like they were in a very good space. They'd actually, just three months prior to the attack, undertaken intensive cyber testing so they felt like they had done absolutely everything that they could, but just the sophistication and skillfulness of these criminals who want to gain access, they will be able to do. So we will provide that, that recording when we share it and really powerful messages from Erica throughout it. So Michael, we now have more of an understanding about what's happening in terms of cyber trends and how critical mitigation strategies are for schools and the education sector. Can you talk us through what schools can actually do in terms of management strategies? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So th there's a lot of consideration here that everyone hopefully recognizes that this is a significantly evolving space. It's probably one that for whatever particular reason hasn't been given the same attention as say your tangible asset space. We all have sprinklers, we all have locks on doors. We haven't had to think like that necessarily to the same degree in Cyberland. So what we do is we try to break it down into four easily absorbable points because we take on board it. It's a big, complex, challenging environment. So from my point of view, we break it down into this loop, which is again, it's designed not to be linear. It can be bounced between one point to another, but it gives you the four things to really focus on in my point of view. I always stress from, I believe you've got to understand the financial risks associated with what an event means to you in order to then make some informed decisions on where you want to move through the loop here, as we call it. So understanding what a bad day means to you, you can then map that to your mitigation strategies, your recovery strategies, and you can ultimately then map that to your transfer, your insurance solutions or your contractual solutions in place find that if you do this process, these four steps in any particular order, you are starting to become much more resilient to a cyber attack. You're starting to become much more informed. And we will see that organizations, as obviously we're starting right now at the very high end of town with the banks being forced to do certain protocols, that will permeate through the industry. Education will be certainly within scope for these sorts of changes that will come through. But in housing that now, I think it's critical to understand what is at value to you. What risk do you have associated with a cyber attack? That leads to then some much more informed decisions around what mitigation strategy you, you want to do. How do you want to adapt your cybersecurity posture as it is? What do you want to add? What do you want to change in order to ensure that you're, you're addressing the right risks accordingly? And the same from the recovery perspective. I think that can't be overstated either, just how important it is to drill an incident, test an incident. What does it mean to you? How do you recover? 
And once you've started to really map that out, then your insurance policy, cyber insurance should not be treated like a traditional line of insurance. It shouldn't be something that you look at once a year, put it on the shelf, dust it off to renew in 12 odd months time. It really should be something that as you go through these loops, look at your insurance policy to say, does it align to, to the risks that we're identifying? I could talk to that for ad nauseum, but we might skip to the next slide. This is a takeaway. We're certainly not going to be covering this today because it's a big conversation. And frankly, I believe that's the conversation for later this month or next month to go through these in much more detail. Just want to highlight something that hopefully everyone's seeing is multi-factor authentication is on there. If you're taking nothing away from this other than one thing, please let it be, have multi-factor authentication everywhere. Wonderful. I think that's it's very important to hone in on that because it is something that really in all of this, the case studies we went through, even if that first infiltration still happens, having MFA actually would have stopped the entire attack. And it is something that we really now see as a minimum requirement. And, and Michael, I know that, you know, across the majority of other industries, before you can even get insurance companies want to make sure that you have that in, in place. So it is really important for you to double check that you have MFA, certainly number one on your staff, ideally across your student base too, but across staff is definitely the most critical. We've also seen in the case studies that um, even in circumstances of having all of the right IT measures, human behavior and clicking on a link and having lack of awareness is certainly a major risk that really stems into nearly all of the case studies that we went through. And that's what we'd like to discuss the rest of today's session, and particularly talking about the fact that cybersecurity needs to be run from the top of the school. So, Michael, can you talk us through why this is a, a board issue rather than a, a tech issue? Yeah, absolutely. I think we've said it there in red, and it's worth just focusing on that. Typically, greater governance will drive greater cybersecurity because it's it's critically important. We've migrated away, thankfully, from the position that this is an IT issue or it's a security issue to this is an enterprise issue. And in order for the enterprise to understand the risk, it really needs to be something that is raised from the very top. It needs to be board. It needs to be executives that are on board with understanding the risks, understanding how to mitigate the risks and how to respond to the risks. And the more, and again, these are all things that are driving now throughout the ecosystem that boards and executives will need to be more up to speed with the risks associated here and, and, and the steps and measures in place to mitigate those. It's not a fact, it's no, no longer a place where the IT or the security team will be the sole responder to these sorts of events. And frankly, it shouldn't be because when something goes wrong, the IT security fix may be a week, a two, two weeks. But unfortunately, the implication to the enterprise can last for significantly longer. So the the management um, and the boards and the executives need to be on board for that in order to understand how to mitigate those sorts of events. And once that starts to permeate through the culture a lot more, I think we'll find that change will necessarily happen automatically. And we really shouldn't be necessarily trying to keep an IT or a security person away from these conversations. We really should be elevating them into these conversations as well. It's not expected that boards of directors will pick up cybersecurity tomorrow, but they do need to be more inquisitive. And the best way to have that is to have someone in the ecosystem who has some understanding of this. That's great. And that lends very nicely, Fee, into some of the work that you guys in government with have been doing with respect to the, the skills gap. Can you talk us through this? Lynette and Michael, with the work that we do, we evaluate whole boards about their governance risk, but the individual directors and executives as well about their skills. And what we're finding on boards is that in order for the right questions, and as you said, discussions to start happening at the board level, you've got to move away from your traditional understanding of what is a skills-based board or what are the kind of skills you need on the board. You actually need people with these sorts of knowledge and background understanding to be able to really 
smell risk when it passes you in a report at the boardroom table to be able to sense the sorts of discussions we need to have. And what we do with this data is to have a look at where are the lowest risks being highlighted. That will have the greatest impact on an organisation. And straight up, which points to your issue, Michael and Lynette, ICT strategy and governance is the lowest score across the board. And it doesn't matter what sector we're talking about. We work in education and health and all of those not-for-profit, highly regulated industries. 27.52% uh, of directors say they feel even the remotest bit confident about this topic or have experience in this. So you can appreciate when you're talking about the kinds of questions that directors should be asking, because when you're on a board, it's the questions you ask that drive activity within the organisation for the reporting and the kinds of answers that come back to the board. And clearly with this sort of low understanding or background in this area, the questions aren't appropriate. And with that, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but Michael and Fee, can you maybe share some of your top things that should be the items that boards are considering when they're looking at cybersecurity and cyber risk? I'll start and I'll hand over to you, Fee, but I think it, it really comes back to point one on here, which is know what's at risk, know the value of your data, KYD, know your data and the impacts of that, know where it is in your network, who has responsibility for it and who wants it and what a bad day may be. I think that is the major point to drill into everyone. Any one of these other ones are important, but Fee, that's the one I want to focus on. Yes, no, exactly. And look, I love the, I love all of these, but number two is really crucial. Adopt a recognised standard for management and board oversight of cybersecurity. And what has tended to happen in the past is this is an abdicated responsibility to executive. We have spent a lot of time in our governance training saying to directors, fingers out, that's the executive's job. Governance is all about strategy. But where boards do need to get their fingers in is where we're talking about the top risks. And boards need to know inherently a management plan shared with exec together about what they do have to protect and actually talk about that regularly and get regular data. One of the biggest things, Michael, that I see boards doing is two things. One, understanding their own skills and upskilling. And two, doing scenario plans long before. Let's have a scenario about what on earth could happen here and let's play that out, but not on their own with exec and with the board subcommittees that this is task two. Wonderful. And I think I'll just also throw in point 10, which is actually purposely listed as the mm. last one, because to Michael's point, having a cyber insurance policy is not what your cyber risk management strategy should be. It really is that port of call that can be there for you should something still get through the system. But really do make sure that you have a cyber insurance policy. Luckily, 83% of Aon schools do have cyber insurance and have it with CFC, who you have seen through the case studies today, provide incredibly strong coverage. But if you are one of those schools that don't have it, please do speak to your client manager about getting a quotation because it, it is a must-have insurance protection from our point of view. So thank you, Fee. Thank you, Michael. I think that was an incredibly interesting session and slightly a bit terrifying. Next month, we will stick to the topic of cyber, which is the number two risk on the risk report, but we'll get stuck more into the IT side of things and we'll be joined by Solis Security, which is a specialist security firm on really unpacking the essential eight. And, yeah, and cyber risk mitigation strategies that schools should be considering. And no doubt, Michael, MFA will be on there. <laughs> um, <laughs> if it's not, so, I'll be surprised. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, thank you, everyone, for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. And we look forward to seeing you again next month.